This is the second of two videos covering the Computer Fundamentals Lecture 4. This video will focus on memory. Memory holds data and instructions, usually in a chip or a series of chips depending on the capacity of the chip itself. Memory can be single chips plugged in or embedded in the motherboard. It can even be on expansion cards like a video or sound card and there are even small memory chips inside the CPU itself. One of the functions of this type of memory is to store results of instructions performed by the CPU before they're sent back to the main memory of the computer. The main type of memory inside your computer, the one that is generally referred to as memory, is random access memory, or RAM. It is an electronic form of memory, unlike storage devices discussed in Lecture 3. This means that while there is power, it's working, but when the power goes off, the data in RAM is lost. This is known as volatile storage. Volatile storage is storage that is lost when the power goes off. Why not watch the YouTube video linked in the description about how RAM works? RAM is electronic and therefore volatile because electronic storage provides the fastest reading and writing of data. So we trade off its volatility for its speed. In the last lecture we discussed the relative speeds of hard drives and solid state drives. So while SSDs work faster than HDDs, random access memory works at least a hundred times the speed of these types of storage. On mobile devices, we can actually manage the RAM using an app of one type or another. And as you can see from this image here, it says that to enable quick reopening, Android operating system applications remain in the memory even when they are closed. Now, while it's good that they remain open so they can be reaccessed quickly, it can mean that your mobile device will behave more slowly because there is less RAM available for the applications you want running. So you can use a RAM manager to kill off some of the unwanted processes on the device. Most personal computers also have software that can do this, but because applications are removed from RAM when they are closed, it's less of an issue. The CPU processes instructions which are loaded into RAM from another location, like a hard disk drive or even a flash drive. Once loaded, the data has to travel from RAM to the CPU. That communication time can often be the slowest part of processing of data in the computer. The system of wires, ports and devices that are responsible for the communication inside your computer are known as the bus. If you have a slow bus, your computer will be slow. Therefore, to reduce the impact of a slow bus, CPU manufacturers speed up the process by storing the most frequently used data in what's called cache memory. Cache memory is usually etched into the CPU chip itself, and so we really can't see it. It's tiny and very fast, and is only used for important data the CPU needs to read quickly and often. In terms of capacity, cache memory only holds small amounts of data, for example, 4 megabytes. Unlike RAM, which can hold large amounts of data, for example, like 4 to 64 gigabytes and beyond. Another type of memory that's embedded into your computer motherboard and other devices is read-only memory, or ROM. Instructions stored on the ROM chip are written at the time of manufacture, and it's permanent memory, or at least semi-permanent. Data will remain in ROM when the power goes off, and therefore, unlike RAM, it's defined as non-volatile. In fact, RAM is the only volatile storage that we encounter. The most common use of ROM is to load the basic input-output system, or BIOS, when a computer is first switched on. The BIOS is loaded into RAM, and the instructions sent to the CPU perform a test of all devices connected to the motherboard. And if they're working correctly, it tells the CPU to load the operating system from its storage location, like a hard drive, into its RAM, and then the BIOS is no longer needed. The CPU then follows the instructions from the operating system, rather than from the BIOS. ROM chips are also present in devices like game consoles, tablet computers, mobile phones and peripheral devices like keyboards and mouses. 
So-called smart appliances like microwave ovens and washing machines also have ROM chips. However, these are more likely to store the entire operating system for the device. One interesting application of ROM occurs in your keyboard. This ROM chip knows which key has been pressed, as well as any modifier keys like Shift, Control, Alt, etc. and looks up the appropriate code to send to the CPU. Now working for Toshiba in the early 1980s, Dr. Fujio Masuoka invented flash memory. It became known as flash memory because of one of Dr. Matsuoka's colleagues said that the process of erasing data from the memory reminded him of the flash of a camera and the name stuck. Flash memory is used in many mobile devices, cameras and USB drives we use on a day-to-day -day basis because flash memory can work like both RAM and ROM. It will retain its data without electricity, and the data can be changed or erased. So in devices where the speed of processing is less important than space, having one device that can perform the roles of storage and processing is clearly an advantage. So what's the difference between memory and storage? They're often confused with each other, and the use of flash and solid state devices only serves to blur the line between them. But they do have different roles inside the computer. Memory usually takes the form of computer chips like RAM or the CPU that plug into the computer motherboard. The computer needs almost instant access to memory to allow the CPU to process everything quickly. The data in RAM changes often and when the power goes off the data is lost and it's not able to be retrieved unless it's stored somewhere else. Now, storage is like memory but it's designed to store and remember the data for a long time. It's not going to be changed as often as the data in memory, therefore write times to storage can be slower than write times to memory. Storage is usually on a peripheral device and it's always slower than RAM. Both memory and storage capacity is measured in bytes and more recently we talk about megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes and even petabytes. Here's a good way to think about memory and storage. If we compare a computer to an office with a desk and a filing cabinet, then the filing cabinet is the storage and the desk is its memory. The filing cabinet acts like a hard disk. Things can be put into the filing cabinet and retrieved only when you need them. And this takes time. However, the desk is like memory because everything that the office worker needs is on the desk and it's easy to get things quickly while you're working. So imagine if every time you wanted to look at something you have to get it from the filing cabinet. It would slow you down, even if the filing cabinet was right next to the desk. You can also imagine that a bigger desk can hold more documents, so you can do more things or even larger jobs. The same is true if a computer has more RAM. Finally, you can lock a filing cabinet at the end of the day, and so everything remains in there just as the data stored on a hard disk drive or solid state drive remains in storage when the power is turned off. But we know the data held in memory is lost when the computer is turned off, so that'd be like a cleaner coming in at the end of every day and throwing everything away left on the desk. Disaster. Finally, let's compare these two computers. The one on the left is a Tandy 500MC professional system and in 1989 it cost $8,499. It had a 20 MHz Intel processor and a VGA graphics with no dedicated graphics processing unit. It had 2 MB of RAM and could be upgraded to, well, wait for it, 16 MB. Compare that with the ad I found for an all-in-one desktop computer from JB Hi-Fi and you'll see that this computer is nearly 150 times faster, has much more RAM, has a de dedicated graphics processor and is way, way, way cheaper than the 1989 computer. That's the end of the series of videos for Computer Fundamentals Lecture 4.